So as I said, the, the title for today is, is Passing from, from uh, Death to Life, Part 2. And so, yeah, last week, uh, last week we couldn't meet, but two weeks ago. I'm going to keep saying last week because it's stuck in my head. I don't feel like we missed anything. We just kind of, we're going to go right back to, to where we left off. Amen? Amen. And so um, when we talk about passing from, from, from death to life, we're talking about moving from a carnal-led life to, be, to a, a spirit-led life. And if you have your Bible with you and you want to follow along in your Bible, uh, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. If you're a guest today and didn't bring your Bible, that's okay. The scriptures will be on the board. I'd like to uh, move through with the, the New King James Version of the Bible. And by the way, it's good to see so many people here. I want to welcome our guests and, and those who haven't been for a while. Welcome to the, welcome, welcome, welcome back. Welcome home. Amen. Um, but if you weren't here for, for part one, you can always go back and grab it off our YouTube channel. You can listen to it and get caught up. I'm not going to run back through the entire message. Uh, God forbid. Amen. Uh, but to set the stage, like I said, we're, we're experiencing this transformation. We are experiencing a deeper level of, of revelation and of understanding of the operations of the kingdom of God and the kingdom's operations in the earth. You know, that there's, there's that, that uplifting, there's the opening of the eyes and of the heart and of the mind. And I'll tell you what, in all things that we do in Christ, that it's preparation for tomorrow. It's, it's, it's not just a simple preparation for tomorrow. It's getting to know God on a different level that, you know, a lot of times we, we talk about having this relationship with God, but it's so much more than that. We have fellowship with God. When we are believers and we are pursuing and going after the deeper things of God, it's not, it's, we, we think of, of fellowship as high fives and shaking hands and watching games and, and doing scrapbooking and things like that. And that's all good. That's all good. But when we talk about this fellowship with God, it's becoming one with him. It's the communion of the saints. It's the communing together of the people of God and God our Father. And so even as these other events and things are taking place, realize, I mean, if you're one with God and not one with God, then we are one together with God, right? Well, that's why whenever two or three are gathered together, he said, I'm right there. I'm right there. How are you there? Because I'm one with God. His spirit dwells on the inside. That's the great mystery of the gospel is the spirit of God dwelling on the inside. And you'll hear me reference this a lot about being the children of God, about being the sons of God. And I'll use the Greek word, the technon of God, because it, 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 it means something. It's, it's, I'm not just trying to be smart. I can be smart without you. But, but what, I, what, what, what I want to do is to grab the essence, because when we, we speak these words, amen, I'm, here we go, because I'm, I'm calling down truth. I'm calling down the truth of heaven into your life. That that is my job today, to call down the truth of heaven into your life and into your heart. And so by spirit to spirit, we receive the deeper things of God. Amen? Now, you got your Bible open? So, so as, as, as we're moving forward, so we're overcoming obstacles, we're overcoming hindrances, and we're realigning with the greater purposes that God has for our lives. How many of you need to overcome some things? They're like, Lord, I don't want to overcome it. I just want you to deliver me from it. As God said, I, I stopped delivering you of all these things when you were children in and, and, and the spirit. But now you are mature in the spirit. Now it's your turn to overcome. It's for you to strap on and become adults in the kingdom of God. It's for you to become the young men and young women in the kingdom of God, to be sons and, and daughters and to be fathers and mothers in the kingdom of God, to influence the lives of so many around us. How many of y'all think that this world needs a touch from Jesus? Yeah. You, uh, the secret is he already touched the world. But now he's put his spirit on the inside of us. That when he ascended on high, he set forth his spirit. As we saw in Acts chapter 2, the, the, the Holy Spirit influencing and, 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 and touching and, and, and living in the saints of God. And so now Jesus is touching the earth through his saints, through the church. Amen? Amen. So in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 2, starting... And, and verse 6, you know, Paul has already said that when I came to the Corinthian church, I, I, I did not come with eloquent words. I did not come with, with, with uh, uh, I did not come in all extra. But I came in to, 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 to share with you nothing but Christ and, and him crucified, which leads to the mystery of the resurrection, which we celebrated on Easter Sunday, the resurrection of our God. Amen? And so in verse 6, he continues and he says, however, we... We speak the wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age or, 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 or of, of these days, nor of the rulers of, of, of this age who are coming to nothing. But we speak wisdom of God in a mystery. Say that word, mystery. mystery. You know why he calls it a mystery? 
Because it's mysterious, amen. And so he speaks to, he says, the wisdom of God in a mystery, uh, the, the hidden wisdom or the once hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for what purpose? Our glory. That, and what is our glory? Our glory is when we are transformed into the likeness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Our glory is, is when we get past all of our, our carnal and earthly nature. Now we, we really dawn, we put on the Lord Jesus Christ, and we are transformed into the likeness of Jesus Christ. Amen? He said, uh, uh, before the ages of our glory, uh, which none of the rulers of this age knew, for if they had known, they never would have crucified the Lord of glory. If, if they had known and understood, and, and we walked through this a little bit a couple of weeks ago, it's not because they would have had a conscience not to do it, but they would have realized that something more powerful was coming after the crucifixion, even after the resurrection. We're talking about the power of the resurrection, and that was beautiful. And here's Jesus glorified. I'm, I'm stepping out, out of the grave, and yet at the same time, Jesus is going, wait, remember? Don't hang on to me, woman. Don't cling to me. I've not yet ascended. There's something greater that is still coming. Don't hang on to this image of me resurrected. There's still something more. There's still something greater that is coming. Amen. He says in verse 9, But as it is written, eye has not seen, ear has not heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man the things which, which uh, God has prepared for those who love him. Or in other words, it's a mystery. We can dream about it. We can make movies about it. All the things that we could do, but it's not really entered yet into the heart of man. Everything that's going to happen, all the things that we do for those who, who love him. Verse 10, but God has revealed unto us, the apostles, the saints, through his spirit. For the spirit searches all things. Yes, what things? The deep things of God. How many deep people. Would you say I'm a deep person? Anybody in here would say you're a deep person? Just a bunch of shallow people. That's a bunch of empty shallow. No, there's some vessels of glory in here. Amen. Amen. I ask you, you're deep. You say, yes, I'm deep. Bring your own bell next time. Amen. And so, so we, we walk into this, the, 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 the depth, the deep things of God. And, and in verse 11, I didn't give this a projection, so, so, so be cool, but but he says, for what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of a man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. There's something deeper that's coming. There's something deeper that is yet to be revealed. Verse 12, now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things which have been freely uh, given to us by God. And in verse 14, it says, but the natural man, the, the, the normal human, anybody here, you just want to be normal. I said, you know, I'm tired of being strange. I just want to be normal. I, I, I want to stay as far away from normal as possible. Amen. I want to be the epitome of abnormal. Amen. He said, but the, the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. And so when, when we look at that, the, here, here's the thing. We have become the uh, stewards of the knowledge of God. That the whole world might think you've got it wrong, but if you're right with God, you got it right. As a matter of fact, I'm going to get to this uh, uh, by the grace of God, by the time we close, the only people who think that you're normal are going to be people in Christ who have been normalized in Christ Jesus. Everybody else is going to think you're weird. Everybody else is going to think that, see, you don't line up with the things of the world, and they're right, you don't. You line up uh, with the things of another world, God's world, God's creation, God's cosmos, the, the orderly arrangement that God had established from the beginning. Amen? So it talks about the mystery. What, what is the mystery? It's, it's the mystery of passing from death to life. Uh, the dwelling of the Holy Spirit that is, that is offered to us without measure, uh, for whom he, he, gives, he gives the Spirit whom he wills, and to those who answer the call of God. But actually, it goes a little bit deeper than that. It's those who call on God. It's those who open up, as we're talking about in the, in the prayer time, that we call on God, that we create a place where God dwells. God will dwell on the inside, but that we actually create atmospheres. How many are glad for spiritual atmospheres? You know, there's sometimes it's like you walk around all week long going, I don't get it, I don't get it. I don't get it, but you come to church and suddenly you get it. Matter of fact, you might leave church and lose it. 
But thank God for spiritual atmospheres. I'm talking about spiritual atmospheres. It's good to have a spiritual atmosphere that you can come to and, and, and worship God among the saints and, and hear the mysteries of the word of God. But it's even better when you have a spiritual atmosphere at home where whatever you lose in the world, you can pick it up back at, at home. You know, like spiritual uh, a Wi-Fi, a, a spiritual cloud. You know, I, I, I save my knowledge to the, the cloud. I don't have it in the car, but boy, when I get home, it's there. Amen? Anybody ever have an experience like, like when you wake up uh, early in the morning and you get quiet time and, and you open your Bible and suddenly everything makes sense? But then, you know, when the day starts, it's kind of like, well, it makes sense of everything. But I, I can make sense of something. And one thing I do know is that it doesn't make sense now, but it will make sense tomorrow morning when I wake up. Because you're creating a spiritual atmosphere in your home. Because you're creating these, these shelters and spiritual places. Turn to John chapter 5. <clears throat> John chapter 5 tells the story of a man that was healed by Jesus at the pool of Bethsaida. Do you remember that? He was healed, he was healed by the side of the pool uh, on the Sabbath day, which was a no-no. It was like a double no-no. First of all, don't heal, and then number two, definitely don't do it on Sabbath. It's crazy. The man describes his life, 38 years, sitting by the side of the pool, waiting for an angel to come and to stir the waters. you remember this story? 38 years. Anybody here... Um, Lived for 38 years. Anybody here not 38 years old yet? Yeah, it's more than your lifetime. Think about that. More than your lifetime. He's sitting here waiting, think of all things, for an angel to come and to stir the waters. You would say that person was nuts, right? I mean, something may stir the waters, but an angel, give me a break. He wasn't the only one that was there. There was many people that were there. And, and so he's, he's waiting on, on, on the side of the, uh, of the pool. So, what, you know, whether by truth or by fable, but I believe it was of truth. And, 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 and so he was hoping that somebody would come along and help him down into the water. He was there with a, a hope and an expectation that there would be somebody who would come and, and lower him into the waters when the angel come and stir the waters because apparently the angel only had enough power for one healing. I have a theory about that, but I'm going to stick to the word. And see me later, I'll give you my theory about angels stirring waters. Wouldn't you like to see that? Just well, The waters are stirring, and, and whoever gets in there first, they get healed. So Jesus comes, and he sees him there, and, and, and he asks him, he said, will you be made whole? You know, will thou be made whole? That is so powerful. I, I keep hearing that in my spirit today. I keep walking past people who are not whole. They're not whole emotionally. They're not whole mentally. They're not whole physically. They're, 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 not, they're not whole, not 100%, not perfected. There's something that is off. And, and oftentimes I look and say, well, will you be made whole, though? Is it your desire? Is, is, is it the path that is chosen for you that you should be made whole? And so many people, I, I'm waiting for one to just go, yes, that's me. Thank you. But so many times people are like, well, you know, God will do what God's going to do. You know, if, if this is his will for my life, then I just accept it. When, when you are in, in, in that fellowship, that oneness with God, you know what his will is. You know that, that, that either this is or this is not, that this is going to come to pass or it is not going to pass. And so that's why we need to seek God and to know him. And I'll tell you what, if, if God's answer to you is a no, you'll be at total peace with that. You will not be depressed by it. You're not going to worry about whether or not God loves you. You're not going to be worried about whether or not this person gets healed or that person gets healed and, and you don't get healed. I'll tell you what, you'll be at a place where you're like, you know what, I'm fulfilling God's mission in my life and God is fulfilling mission through me. Amen? And so he's at this place and, and uh, Jesus asked if he'll be made whole and, and he answers. His answer was, I have nobody to help me. He said, I'm, I'm not fast enough to get in the water and I have nobody who, who, who will let me down into the, the water. He never actually answered the question, do you desire to be made whole? He never actually, he, he just rattles off all the reasons why he can't be healed. Jesus' immediate response is this. He says, rise, take your bed, and walk. In other words, he's saying, your sickness is over. He said, you know, I don't have to, just Jesus, Jesus is greater than the angels. Walks by, and he sees somebody who's been sitting there and, and, and he said, I don't have to stir the waters. I don't have to push you in the water. I don't have to dunk you in the water. Just listen to what I'm saying. Jesus said, I have command of all authority in heaven and the earth. If I say you healed, you healed. If I say it is done, it's done. If I say it's finished, it's finished. If I, if I declare the end of one season in your life into another season, it's, it's done. It's over. And so we, we trust in the things of God. You know what, you know what he did when Jesus said, rise and take your bed and walk? 
Yeah, he rose, he took his bed, and he walked. Exactly. There was, there was no argument. There was no stress. There was no tension. Uh, he didn't need confirmations. He, he, he wasn't waiting for, for the heavens to open and, and, and God to say, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. He just got up, and he walked with his bed, even though it was illegal for him to do so. And then you have the rulers that saw him carrying his bed. They were the Sabbath police. They came up on him and said, today is the Sabbath, and you're doing work by carrying your bed. Who told you you could do that? And he said, I don't know. Some guy told me, get up, rise, take my bed, and walk. And, and so I figured he had more authority than you, so I rose, took my bed, and I walked. And that's the end of that, right? And then it, it just comes to this place where, you know, let me pick up in, in, in John 5, 14. They had to set the stage. Was this a description I really want to take a look? So, so afterward, Jesus found the man in the temple and said to him, See, you have been made well. Sin no more, lest the worst thing should come upon you. That is so significant. Yeah, well, first of all, let me point this out. <clears throat> Where did Jesus find a healed man? In the temple. Do you know why he was in the temple? Because he could go in there. When he, was, when he was not well, when he was lame, he, could, he was not allowed in the temple. You're impure. You're not whole. You don't belong in here. Get out to the pool. Wait with all the other lame ones. But now he's in the temple. He's walking around. He's bad. Probably still got the bed on his shoulder. He never told him to put the bed down. But here Jesus finds him in the temple. And he said, you've been made well now. Now sin no more lest the worst thing should come upon you. Or in other words, Jesus, but well, you think about what you're saying, but you were a sinner and you're walking a lame sinner's life. But now you have been set free. I have broken the chains off of your life. I've set you free from all the things that were drawing you and pulling you. And now that, I, now that I've got you there, he said, go and sin no more. And we understand that when you've been set free and delivered, that there is a time when, when spirits, Jesus said it himself, that, well, they, they roam the dry places. They've been cast out. They roam in the dry places. And when they come back and have found the house clean and swept, they bring seven spirits more wicked than themselves. There's a mystery in that right there. But I'll tell you what, I'm going to just take Jesus at his word. I don't know about you, but when I get set free from sin, I'm not going back, you know. And if I do, I'm quick to repent. I'm quick to turn and say, Lord, what do I have to do to get this monkey off my back? What do I have to do so I'm no longer in the category of sinner? Now, we, we tell you, all you got to do is just repent and turn from your wicked ways and all these things. I tell you what, I need to hear from God sometimes. Because it's not just a matter of being forgiven. I want to be restored. I'm not just restored in, in a place of, okay, well, you're righteous and Christ. No, 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 no. When I sinned, I fell off the path. And now I need to get back up on the path. What must I do? I will not fight against God. I need God to open the door for me. I need him to eject the enemy from the gate. Amen. 38 years. Verse 15, the man departed and, and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. He didn't know who it was before, but now he knows it's Jesus. I guess he didn't see the name tag before. But this time when Jesus spoke to him, he said, you, you, that, you Jesus. It says, verse 16, for this reason the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him because he had done these things on the Sabbath. What things? Healing a man. And commanding him to carry his bed. You know, causing him to sin by carrying his bed. Jesus said, I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. That, that, that you, you would, you would, 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 would uh, feed your, your donkey. You would give water to your, your donkey. You, you would, if they fell in a pit, you would pull them and you would take care of your livestock better than your fellow man. You're mad because a, a man who has been lame for 38 years is now walking and you're concerned that he broke the law of the Sabbath got to be kidding. As we, as we read through the following section of text, I want us to be able to hear Jesus as he walked and as he spoke in the earth. I think too many times as we're reading through scripture, we think of Jesus' voice as just being very uh, passive. We think, we, we think of, uh, Jesus just kind of spoke softly to people. But I'll tell you what, the more I read the word of God and to see how people responded to Jesus, I imagine he was a very dynamic speaker. He spoke with very power and authority. I never heard anybody in the Bible as I looked through, I never heard anybody look back to Jesus and said, what? No, no well, not once. Is it? What did you say? I didn't understand what you said. No, they understood because he spoke words, but it was spiritual power. That was, even if you didn't understand it, I think you'd be afraid to go, what? Right? You'd be right up in there. And so, so that's how I want it. Jesus spoke convincing words, and he spoke words with mystery. You know there are things they didn't get. 
right? Though he spoke with mystery, but he also spoke with power and, and with authority. Or in other words, when people heard Jesus speak, even though they didn't get it in the moment, they didn't dismiss it. They said, I'm going to pray about it. I'm going to go back. I'm going to figure this thing out. Or I'm going to get around somebody who knows and understands, right? So they sought to kill him because he had, he had done these things on the Sabbath. In verse 17, it says, but Jesus answered them. And he said, my father has been working until now, and I have been working. I mean, he, 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 he's like, you guys think you're upset now? Wait till I start to drop some real knowledge on you about who's standing before you. Jesus, in this statement, reveals his eternal nature and his divine nature. And he makes a statement. He said, my father, when he said that, he said that I'm one with the father. Verse 18 says, therefore the Jews sought to kill him even more because he not only broke the Sabbath, but he also said that God was his father making himself equal with God. Or in other words, he's saying, I am one with God. That, that me and God have an understanding. I hate that when people say that today because that they try to elevate themselves. But Jesus, where was he going to elevate himself to? He's the son of God. Amen? He said, I'm in agreement with God. So Jesus answered and said to them, most assuredly I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the father do. For whatever he does, the son also does in like manner. That's a powerful set of scripture. Jesus is saying, everything that I have done in the earth, everything that I do, I do it because I have seen my father do it. And this, it's a challenge because I start to look through at all the signs and wonders and miracles that are recorded that Jesus did. And I'm saying, if he said he saw this happen, then it had happened. There was a precursor to it, right? And I start looking and searching through Scripture. I'm like, he did do this, didn't he? He did see this. Multiplication miracles he did through Elisha, right? Multiplying the bread. That a, a, a first fruit offering was given to Elisha. He said, I don't need that. He said, give it to the people. And it, and it fed a vast number of people. So Jesus walking on water. And you think about that. But who walked on water other than Jesus? That was very unique to Jesus, right? Oh, I'm sorry, Genesis 1-2. The Spirit hovered over the deep. In the book of Job, it talks about him uh, uh, dwelling on top of the waters. When he crossed over the Jordan, when he crossed over the Red Sea, when, when these things happened and the water uh, responded by parting, he had command and power and authority over the waters. I, I keep looking at all these, these, these different uh, places and different things, but there's something more. There's a greater impl uh, implication that Jesus is making here. He said that when it happened, I was there. He's, he's implying that he had a, a power. How many of you know that the word shows us Jesus had a powerful prayer life? Like, if you're all powerful, why do you need to pray? He said, because without it, I couldn't do any of this. If I haven't seen it, I can't do any of this. And so he's at a place where you know, he has gone to the place and, and worshiping God, and he went to the top of the mountains. He went into the caves. He had a place where, where he had, in the spirit, opened portals. He created altars. And there he could see what God the Father was doing. And a matter of fact, he was a part of it because the Father and Son are one. Part of these things. That's not blasphemy. That's truth. Jesus speaking the truth. He's bringing these things forward. Verse 20, Jesus continues, for the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself does. So God is demonstrating it. And he will show him greater works than these that you would marvel. In other words, I'll show you greater things to confuse you. I will do greater things in the earth so that you will go, I don't get it. So that you will, you will be confused. And, and so sometimes this, we see God working wonders in the earth. Anybody seen some, some wonders? Uh, happened before you, miracles, you've seen things like that, a oh, 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 wonder-working power of the blood of the Lamb, amen. We start thinking about these things. And so when we see God's working in the earth, we got, th we got some choices to make. When we start to see God move, we, well, the first choice we can, we can resist. We can resist and go, I don't think that's God. That's definitely not God. God wouldn't do something like that. And I was like, you know what? Be careful how you judge God. The Bible says, uh, be careful that you do not, uh, who, who are you to, to judge uh, another servant? We watch, we watch these kinds of things, and so we've got to look to see what is God, what is not God. We have another option, which is to marvel. Like they said that you might marvel. 
that you might become confused and disoriented. That's, a, that's an option that we have. When, when God begins to move and make things happen, we can allow ourselves to fall into this place where we have to overanalyze things. The brother Diz talking about receiving the offering today, talking about that place of pride. That that's something that we, we sit there, we try to overanalyze things, and then we decide that it's impossible, even though it's happening right before our eyes. The third option, we can, well, we can take up our bed and walk. We, we, can, we can walk in a place of belief. We can walk in a place of, I've seen God work a miracle over there, why not a miracle over here? Why not a miracle in my life, or better yet, why not a miracle in the life of somebody that I love? You see a restoration work happening in, in, in somebody else's life. Why can't you work that restoration in my life or in, in the life of somebody that I care about and that I love? If you could use that person as an instrument of work, could you use me as an instrument of the same work? That, these are our, 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 our responses. Verse 21 says, For as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the Son gives life to whom he will. For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son, that they all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Verse 24, <clears throat> and this is it. He said, most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment or shall not come into condemnation, but he has passed from death to life. You see that? Leave that verse up. That, that, that having passed from death to life is what we're talking about today. Having moved from something dead into something that is alive. And just a, a couple verses earlier, he said that God would give life to whom he will and raise them up from the dead. He said, so the Son will also do. And so we can come from a place of spiritual deadness into a place of spiritual life and of vitality. How many of y'all know God's got something better for you? He, there, there is something that is just out ahead of you. Every day should be better than yesterday. Because we are moving and we are passing from dead things into life things. And sometimes we don't recognize it because we're not used to living. But he's bringing us into eternal life. He's bringing us into everlasting life. He's bringing us into something, you know, we, we, so, so many years being dead and we didn't even know we were dead. Doing dead things. Hanging out with dead people. But yet, he's saying there's life. There's better for you. And sometimes we don't want better. We don't want life because we're so used to being dead that we don't want to be alive. But God will make dead a miserable place for you because he wants you in eternal life. Amen? Am I making sense to you? Amen. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. So, so you said, most of what I say to you, so he who hears my word, to hear means you give audience to the word. It means you listen to it. That when God's speaking, that you stop and you listen. There's times when God begins to speak to somebody. I'm not talking about listening to me. Please listen to me. But... When God begins to speak into your life, that you immediately shut things off and, and, you, and you run all off and, 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 and you got other things to do, more important things to do. We need to prioritize hearing from God. We need to prioritize that time at the, at the foot of the altar. Prioritize the things that we do to hear from God. If it's worship, if it's prayer, if it's coming to church, if it's, if it's being quiet before him. We, we, need to, we need to spend time doing these things. Sometimes we're talking about hearing from God, and sometimes the reason we don't hear from God is because we don't give God the chance. We're too busy in our lives. It can take more than 10 minutes to hear from God. It could take months to hear from God. It could take years to hear from God. Just because you're not hearing doesn't mean something's wrong with you. It just means you're not ready yet. Well, what does he say? He said, my sheep know my voice. They will not follow the voice of a stranger. And so we get to a place where we say, well, am I a sheep of God or am I not a sheep of God? And so you might be the sheep of God, but you haven't yet prepared the table before yourself to hear from God. And if you're at that place, then no, you're not yet a sheep of God. My sheep know my voice. My, my sheep will spend time in prayer. My sheep will, will spend time before the holy places and the altars of God. That's what it means. You've got to put on the sheep's clothing. Amen? That sounds bad because like, what about the wolf in sheep's clothing? I said, I, I think some wolves can be saved, amen. <laughs> Start to put it on like we put on the Lord Jesus Christ, amen. They talk about having belief. He's, he hears my word and believes, and to believe means to have faith in. It means to trust. It doesn't mean I just get it in my head and like that's fine, because belief has actions. Belief has words. Belief has attitudes. When I believe it, it changes my being, amen. I believe in the hour that we're in, mature believers and hopeful believers 
even people of childlike faith, they should take this verse. They should write it down in their notebooks. They should transcribe it somewhere. They should tape it to the refrigerator or tape it to the wall and begin to read over that scripture over and over again until it gets into your heart, begins to make sense, and you see yourself alive inside of that scripture. It becomes a prayer or a proclamation of faith. And you look and you read that scripture and you say, Lord, um, help me. Let me be that man. Help me, God. Not like help me, like hold my hand and walk me through it, but to deliver me. Heal me, Lord God. Get me out of the dead places and, and let me be that man that believes. Let me be that man that hears. Let me, let, let me step up into this, this newness of life. The one who has heard and the one who has believed. The one who has entered into everlasting life. That's where I want to be. He who has passed from death to life. With a testimony, not just words of a blah, 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 blah. No, no, no. I actually came out of a dead place. I actually understand what it, what it means when, when, when he talks about dead things being not alive in Christ, not having the Spirit of God in me or in my life. That there's a place where you need the Spirit of God not just to inhabit you, but to inhabit your life, to in, inhabit your circumstances. You know, I was saying this on Wednesday night, and this is deep, that circumstances are a body, and bodies need spirit. And so when you have a circumstance that's going on in your life and it won't crawl, it won't walk, it won't breathe, you know, we need the Spirit of God to give it life so that it works out for your benefit. That, you know, sometimes we think we, we just inhabited by spirits. The spirits are spirits. They go where they want. Remember Jesus cast out all the, 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 the spirit out of, out of the, the, the guy, the, the legion, and Gatherans, and, and, and what happened? Was, oh, we don't want to go to dry places. Don't put us in there. Just send us to the pigs. Jesus said, Boom, you and the pigs. And then what happened? They all went mad and died in the, in the waters. Jesus ain't got no time for, for dead spirits. He's trying to bring things alive. But before you knew him, you had a spirit. You got it from Adam. It was a dynamic spirit. It was a dead spirit. When you come to know Christ, that spirit is ejected like a spent casing. And the spirit of God comes and dwells on the inside, and you are transformed, and you are made new. You just don't know it yet. You need to learn to walk in the newness of life. Wisdom, wisdom, wisdom of God. I'm praying for the wisdom of God. Come down upon our lives today that we can see this. I believe that this is the mystery of the, of the man at the pool of Bethsaida. Those who have seen the blessings of God, but only at a distance. I, I, I believe it's those who have seen the angels work, but only at a distance, only working for somebody else who have watched others walk in blessing, yet you find yourself unable to enter into that same blessing until you get a visitation and a touch from Jesus, until there's an invitation from Jesus. Do you want to be made whole? Will you be made whole? Until there's an invitation to pass from death into life. I tell you, some of the, the, the dark places we talked about, even some of the dead places, it's not like you're just totally dead, just you have aspects of death. But that's what we're being transformed to, to all the aspects of death have now been transformed to aspects of life, of living, of Christ-likeness. Amen? Verse 25. <coughs> Excuse me. And Jesus said, Most assuredly I say to you that the hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. That's powerful. He said, the time is coming when the dead, those who are without life, those who are got no inclination to Jesus whatsoever, but they'll hear his word, and they'll be called forward into life, that they will live. And that's what a lot of us have been praying for. But now let's pray with understanding. Talking about our loved ones and our friends. Part one of the message. We said the power of the resurrection offers us the power to grow and to transform. That's the spirit of God coming to dwell on the inside, that, that Jesus has a secret weapon in the, in the Holy Spirit. And it's when that secret weapon is employed to the inside of a man or a woman or a child that we watch this transformation take place and move forward into the newness of life. We also have the power of the resurrection that gives us access to the deep wisdom of God. Every believer having the ability to, to be a host for the Holy Spirit. So when you walk in, you say, my spirit is not sufficient today. I need a move of God. I mean, I need a move of God in your life. You need to engage the Holy Spirit and let the Spirit of God live on the inside. Amen? So today, I, learned, I think I'm only going to get to one point, but let's see what happens. Amen? We're talking about positioning yourself to walk in, in, in a new life. 
positioning yourself to walk in the life of Christ, to hear his voice and to function accordingly, to maintain your freedom from the darkness, your freedom from dead things or from dead places. Amen? And the point is this. First point is this. Reject the dwelling places of darkness and death. Reject the dwelling places of darkness and death. Or in other words, choose the dwelling places of light and of life. It's a mirror image. You, you choose the darkness or you choose the light. You choose death and, or you choose life. You can't be double-minded in all of your ways. Amen? In recent messages, we, we had a, a three-part series of, of walking out of the darkness, but we spent considerable time talking about the necessity of leaving old things behind and becoming immune or becoming untrappable by the hooks and the entrapment of the places where you used to dwell, the things that you used to do. There's so much that, that, that gets on our souls residually, and, and it hangs on to us, and, and suddenly when we start to walk in life, we're doing well, we get these callbacks. It's like you know, things are calling you back to, to old things, to dead things, to, to old ways, and, and we don't always understand. See, that's the power of darkness. Darkness has a power. I, I, I came up out of that. Diz was sharing some of this earlier about, you know, things he did when he, when he first came to Christ, and, and he still wasn't walking in life because he was listening to his old music. He's still running with the old boys, still living in the old neighborhood. It's time to make some changes and, and some, some transformation, a lot of transformation to, to flow through your life. And so, yeah, it can seem repetitious, uh, but it's, it, it's more than teaching. It's an impartation of the deep things of God. He's going to show us how to get free. It's a roadmap to our freedom. It's a blueprint to getting into a different place. Reject the dwelling places of darkness and of death. Today, we need to go further. To, how many of y'all think we need to go further in our lives? I'm, I'm not satisfied where I am. The crowd's got to bring me into that, that new place. So today, we're asking God to reveal even his deep things, the deep things of God by the Spirit of God, by his Spirit. We're asking God for revelation. If we understand the message of the cross, we understand the blessings of God are for those who believe and live their lives according to those beliefs. In other words, I, I do according to my convictions, and I get my convictions from the Word of God. But not only the Word of God, but from the Holy Spirit. And sometimes I don't have to know the Word. I don't have to know a, a Bible verse and Scripture because the Holy Spirit is wrenching my inside, telling me something is out of order. I'm saying this is not the way. Don't walk in this way. Don't go to that place. Don't do that thing. How many of y'all trust God when he begins to speak? So I was saying earlier, by having to cancel our services last week and this and that, and we were like, the devil, the devil, the devil. I said, praise God, because he stopped something from happening or he's making something happen. But I believe the, I believe the spirit of God is moving and the devil doesn't have that much power. Amen? And we keep pressing forward for deeper things. And so, so as we come, and so we realize that there's no uh, good enough apart from God. There is no good in there. You're not good enough without God. Amen? Our good, the good that you are, must be empowered by God because without him there is no good. And our God has made a way for us to escape death by grace and by faith, denying ourselves, taking up the cross and following after Christ. It's a, it sounds like a very simple uh, set of instructions. And, and, and on one level, it's a very simple set of instructions. But on, on another level, it's very hard. We're not hearing from God. How do I take up my cross? and follow you? How, how can I follow you if I can't see you? How can I, I, I follow you if I can't hear your footsteps? How do I, I follow you if I don't know the way? If I don't have a road map? And he's got, he said, I have an answer for that. I'm going to send my Holy Spirit. And it's going to take up residence on the inside. It's going to show you the way. Follow the path that Christ has laid before you. I'll tell you, Jesus Christ is as powerful, every bit as powerful and pure as he declared that he was in John chapter 5. And one thing I've discovered about the Lord, about the Holy Spirit, he will not lead you into the dark places unless it's to fulfill the destroying of the works of the enemy. That is one thing I, I, I firmly believe, that there's, there's times when, when, he'll lead, when Christ will lead us into the dark places, but we'll know and understand that we are walking in the light. We can't be tempted. We can't be pulled apart. We cannot be destroyed because we are walking on mission with the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? If you've been freed and delivered, don't run to the comfort or recreation from the very thing that you're delivered from. People have been through some very miserable things in life, 
and then God comes into their life and, and, and they discover the Lord Jesus Christ and they can go through deliverance and take five, six, seven years before they're completely uh, cleansed and clean and now they can walk in freedom and the first thing they do with their freedom is, I'm going to go back and visit that old thing. I'm going to go back and visit that old uh, neighborhood. I'm going to go back and visit the old boyfriend. I'm going to go back and, 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 and visit the, the, the dark things that I did in my life that had me entangled in the first place. I'm going to go back and, and, and try on the, 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 uh, the, the handcuffs that had me. I just want to make sure these shackles still fit. Are you kidding? No, I have Jesus Christ. I, I don't have to worry about anything. What did Jesus tell that man? Oh, he said, go and sin no more. There's something worse should come upon you. That's the wisdom that we need to be able to walk in. I said, boy, when that, that dog starts whining, come pat me, come pat me. I said, no, 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 you got teeth. Don't worry. My dog doesn't bite. Does your dog have teeth? It bites. Eventually, it just hasn't bitten yet. Amen. So don't run, in, don't, don't, don't run back to old shelters. Don't run to shelters that you built in the darkness. The darkness is a place of death and deception. You have to understand that. Not, nothing in dark places says, no, stay away from me, I'm dangerous. It's a place of deception. It's a place of ignorance. It's a place of loss. And, and the enemy has a purpose. The enemy dwells in dark places. Did you know that? He's, oh, he can disguise himself as, a, as an angel of light. He can also show his true colors. And he can dwell in these dark places. And he has a purpose. And his purpose is to entice you and to destroy you. Yeah, don't, don't, don't worry, the devil does not love you. The, the devil does not have your best interest at heart. Only Jesus has that. And we trust that. But Jesus doesn't give me what I want. And it's because you probably want the wrong thing. Amen. <laughs> they coughed up a demon right there on that one. <laughs> as I've received it from the Lord the Lord said do not run to shelters that were built in the darkness you notice when Jesus found the man, the man that was healed at the pool first as we said earlier he, he found him in the temple he was living the spiritual life that he was denied the first thing he did was go live the spiritual life I'm free now I'm going to go do what spiritual people do I'm going to go run in the temple and then the first thing Jesus told him, go and sin no more. And, and you know, you've been made well. He's, he says, sin no more. And that word sin, I mean, literally, you know, it, you've probably heard this before, but it means uh, to miss the mark. It means you're shooting for something and you've missed it. And when you sin, it means that you, you are on the right path and now you're no longer on the right path. And you, you, you completely missed the mark. And so the, this could be translated as uh, or paraphrased into lose out on the prize no more. Or in other words, there's a prize to living godly. There's a prize to following the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a prize to being uh, transformed into his likeness. He's saying, don't miss it anymore. It's, it's available to you. It's been available. But now he's saying, don't go back to old things. As believers in Christ, we've been delivered from death to life and to have everlasting life and not to come into condemnation, not to come into damnation. But now we must live the life of belief, pursuing the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ the knowing of his will and his desire. We find ourselves when we are looking for purpose and the fulfillment of life. We must live the, the life of belief, pursuing the Holy Spirit. We ought to be calling on the Holy Spirit. We ought to be going to places where the Holy Spirit is being poured out, where there's an impartation of the Holy Spirit. Amen? The Bible tells us, yeah, as many as led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. And so we come to a place where we realize the place where we are spending our time and our energies, that there are things that we are doing, and, and we're building shelters, we're building structures, we're building altars, we're building things and, and spiritual places. And, and that's why sometimes it takes time because you have to build that, that, that locale in the spiritual place so that you can actually hear from God. That, you know, how many have heard that, that there, of the priesthood of every believer? That we are a kingdom of priests, right? The Bible says we're, we're kings and priests, which is, is properly translated as saying that we are a kingdom of priests. What do priests do? They, may, they offer sacrifices before the Lord. They offer incense, which is an image of prayer, to go up before God. We are communing with God. We're serving God's purpose here on the earth. That's what a priest does, and that's what we are called up into. Jesus is the high priest. 
And he has shown us the way, but we have to be operating on a different level altogether. And so we look, and when we dwelled in the darkness, we had spiritual structures from which we drew our comfort and our strength. And, and, and we became familiar with these things. And so some of these things are about, you know, life is hard. Anybody, would, anybody here had a really easy life? My life is so easy. Fast day, I never had a bad day in my life. Everything is, is wonderful. Look, Gladys said, Jose's had a wonderful life <laughs> since he married me. Amen. Ring the bell, Pastor Day. Which come to a place where, you know, people found comfort in drugs, found comfort in alcohol, found comfort in the arms of somebody that they should not have uh, been in the arms of, that they found their, their comfort in entertainment, and that has been their escape. You know, that th these, are, these are our strongholds that were built in, in dark places. And so we, we, we've got to come up out of it. We built these structures. And so these structures they, and shelters, they, they, they drew our attention, they drew our energy. They drew our praise. They drew our resources. And, 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 and these places are alive. They still are drawing. They're still calling. They're still trying to draw your energies and your, and your strength to them. And they're carnal or even demonic in nature. And so what we have to do is to, to acknowledge that and say, you know what? i let you go. But what Paul said, he said, all things are permissible for me, but not everything is beneficial. All things are, 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 are permissible, but nothing shall have power over me. And the very moment you realize that something has power over you, you need to step up and go, you know what? I shall have power over you. I will limit myself or I will expel this thing from my life because my life has much more meaning than the pursuit of entertainment, the pursuit of feeling good, the pursuit of, of earthly things. All these things will pass away one day. And you don't want to pass away with it. You want eternal life. Amen? Amen. And so, so, so we start looking. So sometimes we got to let it go. Sometimes we need to cut it off. Sometimes we just got to nail it. We got to take authority in the name of Jesus. There's no higher authority. We need to speak to these things. We said, "Let them go." I like that. Worship them at the tables and the temples no more. Don't go to their dwelling places and let them rule over you. Time to step up. As I'm, 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 I'll bend my knee only to one, and his name is the Lord Jesus Christ. To be able to realize that I've got freedom in Christ Jesus. It's not freedom to sin. It's freedom from it. It's freedom to, to walk a life that, that, of, of, of joy and peace in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Jesus reveals powerful structures that seem to encamp in dark places and, and bring confusion and failure to many who seek the kingdom of God. You remember How many of you remember the Sermon on the Mount? Anybody ever read the Sermon on the Mount? I mean, Jesus is up there and, and, and people are, are not eating. They're hanging out. You know, there, there, was, there, was no, there was no breaks. I mean, Jesus is up there and said, I'm just going to speak with all power and authority. Everybody said, preach on Jesus. And, and so, so he's up there. He's on the side of this mountain. He's beginning to just unload things that don't make sense without the Spirit. He's like, all things are now new. You know, just as you see there. But when you go back and you begin to realize this is what Jesus was doing. He was exposing the shelters and, and exposing the altars and exposing the, the structures of darkness that, that, that the, the general community had adopted. And so we start looking at there. It was one of the first things he says. He, he begins to deal with this, this structure, this, this altar of vengeance. Remember what he said about that? He said, he said, he said, you've heard it uh, uh, said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, but I tell you to you, if somebody should strike you on your cheek, you turn the other cheek. You're like, wait a minute, that doesn't make sense. Of course not, especially if you're not spiritual. But you realize if you're spiritual, you understand the word of God when he says, vengeance is mine. God said, vengeance is mine. And so if you try to rise up and try to be in the place of God, that's pride. Vengeance is, is rooted in pride that, that God says, I have a better way with a better outcome, with a better future. If you will do what I'm showing you how to do, you can walk in forgiveness and be in, in peace. And, and we look at how much of our culture is rooted in vengeance. And I don't know about you, but I know the movies that I like to watch, somebody does something really nasty and evil right in the beginning of the movie. And we wait to the end of the movie for them to get vengeance on them. And you're like, yeah. Anybody else like movies like that? If, if, if that's not how the movie goes, to me, it's a chick flick. That, that, that's, you know, I, I, I'm like, that's, that's a love or romance or something like that. I don't want to see that. I want to see vengeance. And I realize, you know what? If that's what I'm filling myself up with, no wonder I respond sometimes the way that I do. Somebody makes me mad, I want them to be madder. If somebody hurts me, I want them to hurt worse. You know, I'm like, that's not good. That's not God. Aren't you glad Jesus wasn't like that? Isn't like that? 
Aren't you? I mean, aren't you? Aren't you? He's, what, did they put him on the cross and he said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. I said, when we look at this thing, don't mistake vengeance for justice. I like that. Don't, no, justice is, God, God, how many of you are glad we serve a God of justice? Sometimes we need to call him by that name. You are the God of justice. Things aren't working out. Things are going badly. Don't worry, God is a God of justice. He's going to handle all things. That means that, that he will handle those who wrong me, number one, or he'll forgive them and they'll be all right. But I'll tell you what, if that's the case, that means that my blessing is coming. As much as anybody's going to hurt me, God is going to bless me for receiving that pain in the right way and processing it in the right way. My blessing is coming. When somebody makes you mad, just go, hmm, nine, ten, my blessing is coming. And they cut you off on, on the road and they go really slow. You get stuck behind one of these tractor trailers over on, on Hilldale. Just go, my blessing is coming. My blessing is coming. Amen? Real life scenarios and situations right there. What's he say about hatred? People love to hate. It's amazing. But Jesus said hatred equates to, to murder under penalty of death. He who hates his brother for no reason. Right? That's where you, you, you look at that, but what's, what's he teach us? He teaches us to love and to forgive. Love your enemy. Love your enemy. Isn't that easy? Loving people who hate you? Praying for those who, 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 who scorn you and, and spitefully use you? Isn't, isn't that easy? Heck no. But it's godly. Amen? I like it. Lust. 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 Our, our world is driven. The world out there is driven by lust. We don't realize how much that actually impacts our lives as believers. But I'll tell you what, sometimes I'll look, I'll try to look at something a spiritual on, 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 on social media, and I have to go through five semi-pornographic things to get to something spiritual. That's reality. A lot of the television shows and things that, that we try to watch. You, you know, anybody here binge watch stuff? You get through episode three, and all of a sudden it gets nasty? Yeah. But you got me hooked! No! Huh. Well, read the reviews now, because I can't watch the show no more. Amen. What, what did Jesus say about that? He, he talked about lust. He said, that equates to adultery. If your eye offends you, he says, uh, uh, if it causes you to sin, pluck it out. I have my notes right here. I'm, I'm not going to talk about this. It says, too vulgar for Sunday. But greed. Greed is another thing. Remember, I remember, uh, was it Wall Street, the movie? Greed is good. Uh, you know, went to business school? Greed is good. I'm going to, you know, these different things. If you try to accomplish, try to get as much as you can, that kind of thing. Covetousness, hypocrisy, lies, and self defeat. These are all altars that people will go and they visit, structures where they find comfort. You know, if I can't live the life, I'll fantasize about it. That's, that's madness. There's nothing that you're going to get from those structures um, profoundly that you cannot get satiated in a life in Christ. Amen? Be set free from in a life of Christ. Or faithlessness, unbelief. But these things, occult practices. People don't even realize half the time that they're, that they're worshiping in the occult. They don't understand the things that, that they brought into their life and they bring into their homes and, and they bring into their days. And, and, and so they're, they're looking at these uh, occult pro practices and, 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 and uh, idolatry and, and different things. I'll tell you what, there's things that when you are open and when you are really sensitive to the Spirit, you'll be amazed at the things that God will reveal to you and be like, I had no idea that these things are affecting me. I had no idea that these things are, are, are affecting the way that I think because, but, but as, as, as was, was quoted from the book of Isaiah, I have not seen, the ear has not heard, that your eyes and your ears are being opened, that you're being made sensitive to the deeper things of God. And when you realize the reason why I can't draw near to Jesus is because I'm trying to carry devils into holy places. God does not allow that. Nothing unholy enters into the presence of God. Nothing unholy enters into the presence of God. So those are all houses of darkness, and i got a lot more, and maybe I'll share them with you some other time. But every time you visit one of these houses, you give them power. Now let me explain how this works. If you are a child of God, he has empowered you with his spirit. If, if you are a human being, Created in the image of God. You have dominion in the earth. How many of you know that he put man in the earth to have dominion over the earth? That's what I was reading earlier from Psalm 115, that you have a, a power because he, the heavens, they belong to God, but he has given the earth into the, into the children of, of, of men. And so we walk with a certain power. So we go and, and we're, we're energizing them. We are encouraging them. We are pulling them forward. How many of you all like parties? 
I know y'all like parties. You're like, Pastor Dave, we're going to have a party in a little while. You've got to wrap this thing up. And I get it. But let me, understand, let, me, let me help you understand something. How do y'all like to throw a party and two people show up? There's no power in that. But you throw a party and 200 show up, you're like, yeah, you know, I'm the queen bee. I'm up in charge now, right? You, know, you, you draw energy and strength from that. And so the same thing, you go to visit these, these structures, and, and they're drawing power. They're drawing energy. They're, and, and worse than that, they're influencing you to go out and make disciples for, on their behalf. Now, I mean, there's something that's very powerful about that. So you, all right, that's the bad news. You want to hear the good news? Please, Pat, they give us some, some, some good news. Well, just like we can visit dark altars, we can also visit the altars of light. We can visit altars of, of the kingdom of God. And, and, and when we do, they respond with the power uh, of life for the believer. You go to a godly structure, you go to a godly altar, you go to a godly place, I'll tell you what, there's life there that's for you. Jesus is waiting right there. The Holy Spirit is drawing you in, and Jesus is waiting to give you life, not to draw life away from you, but to give you life. But likewise, just by your presence, you bring godliness to that same place. You bring that godliness to it, and it, and it builds up. You know, and, and I was looking through some of the scriptures on this and, and you know, about visiting these godly places. And, and I'm going to just rattle them off to you, but Proverbs 18.10 says, The name of the Lord is a strong tower where the righteous run and they are safe. It's the name of the Lord. What tower am I running to? It's the power of God. It's the power in a name. It's the power that we call. And we're going to get into some spiritual warfare and begin to understand. And when we begin to call God by, by, by a, a name, by a function, the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the living God, when we begin to talk about God, our warring God, our, our, our Savior, our friend, our Redeemer, when we begin to talk about God this way and call upon him and, and you know, and talking about the, the reign of God. How many know that, that Jesus, Jesus, yes, he's our Savior, he's our Deliverer, but, the, but before all of that that's all earthly stuff but in the heavens he is king and, and so he reigns over all of creation do you realize that and so we start to walk, and so we build up our faith. When you are praying and you're asking God to move, and I need God to move today, you better start declare, uh, declaring that he is reigning in your life, that he reigns over your home, that he reigns over your thoughts. And then just declare the goodness and the greatness of God. It stirs up faith, but it calls upon a faithful God who will move in your situation. Too many times we're like, I don't even know if God's going to even do anything for me. And it's like, are you serious? You better know. Remember the persistent widow? Get my justice for me. Get my justice for me. And that was just a, 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 a nagging, persistent widow. But what about when we're calling upon God from a righteous place? I mean, I know that God will move. 18.2, Proverbs 18.2 said, The Lord is my rock and my fortress. Psalm 61.3, uh, You have been a shelter for me, a strong tower from the enemy. I will abide in your tabernacle forever, and I will trust in the shelter of your wings. Psalm 91.1, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High God shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God, and him will I trust. My refuge, my fortress. They're talking about going to a place where, where you are covered, a place where you can run, where you can hide, where you can rest, where they can't kill you if they find you. That's what a refuge is. The shelters and altars we visit when we worship the Lord. Here's some examples of godly shelters, a place of purity. I don't mess with devils, and I'll mess with people I shouldn't mess with. Amen? Love. Love, love, is, a, love is an altar that we, we build an altar. We visit the altar. I'm talking about a, a, a benevolent love, a, a, a love that, that gets poured out without any expectation of, of re reciprocity. We understand that when we love benevolently, God is our reward. Amen? We're talking about a brotherly love, uh, the, the Philadelphia love. We're talking about uh, an Eros type of a love, the love that is shared between uh, a, a man and, and, and his wife, amen, and, and a husband and wife or a wife and her husband, and they come together, and when they're coming together, there's a different type of a love. But when we do this with God in mind, there's such more power that we draw and that we give to godly places. Whew. Thank you, Michelle, for saying Amen. But that's, that's good. Add to that fidelity in marriage. Like, it's not just like, well, you know, we're married, so I won't cheat. It's, no, no, no. I'm married. We don't cheat. We, we, we enjoy one another. We love on one another. This is how we, and we do it in the name of Jesus. That is, there is real power in that. Not just because that's what's expected, and that is cultural. This is the culture of the kingdom of God. 
And when you try to take that away, you try to add other things to it, you know, you can't bring strange fire to the pulpit. You can't, you can't bring that to the altar. Amen? Fidelity in Christ. We're talking about faith, having faith in, in Christ Jesus. A spiritual persistence. That's, that's an altar. That's a structure. Spiritual persistence. Seek and, 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 and find and ask and receive and knock and the, and the doors will be open. That these, are, these are all things in the Sermon on the Mount. These are all the structures that Jesus tells us. This is where we need to go. These are the things that we need to do. And it builds faith. In other words, don't try it for a minute and say it didn't work. Say, you tried it. You didn't see it work, but I know it's working. Is, is that the sound of the abundance of rain? Operating on these principles. Go, look again. Go, look again. Go, look again until there's finally that deliverance. Spiritual vigilance. The, the art of the intercession. The, the, the watcher on the wall. Of, of being vigilant and watching what's taking place in our community, in your home, on your television set, in your music to realize that sometimes things come on and it looks so good, but then there's subtle things that get snuck in there, and you're like, wait a minute, this is no longer of God. This is no longer right. To be able to get these things set right. The altars of knowledge and of revelation. These are all structures within the kingdom of God, and there's so much more. But the reason why we're weak in faith sometimes is because we're not standing in the place where there is strength, where God's called us forward to Ephesians 5, 6, the Apostle Paul writes, let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of, of disobedience. Verse 7, therefore, do not be partakers with them. Don't play at their altars. Don't go to their playground. Don't hang out in the backyard. Don't have a barbecue with the, with the, with the works of darkness. But be pure. Come out from among them, says the Lord. You, you don't remember these things, right? Verse uh, 8, for you were once in darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. See that? You were once darkness, but now you are light uh, in the Lord. Walk as children of the light, finding out what is acceptable uh, to the Lord. And in verse 11, it says, And have no fellowship with the unfruitful work of darkness, but rather expose them. That there's a separating that we are called out to. There's a separation to, to be able to walk into the newness of life. Amen? I'm going to give you the last point, and then I'm going to close. This is, is this good? I ought to get really good, but you guys are pressing me for time. Amen. But the last point is simply this. Spiritually engage the life of love in Christ. A spiritual engagement. So in other words, I can demonstrate love. There's things that I can do. There's, there's, there's outward signs, but am I engaging it in the spirit? Am I loving you from the spirit, or am I just trying to uh, get something out of you or, or trying to get something out of God. Spiritual engagement, it's more than willpower. You know, it's more than I will do this and everything will be fine. It's allowing the Spirit to actually lead you and to guide you and to take you into deeper territories. It's more than mental gymnastics, more than periodically uh, going out and handing out sandwiches or doing things that will invoke gratitude from man or from God. It's so much deeper than that. First John 3.11, he says, If we're the message that you heard from the beginning that we should love one another, not as Cain, who was the, of the wicked one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his works were evil and his brothers were righteous. The, 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 Cain was a, a carnal man and he dwelled in death and in dark places. And I believe that Cain had dark altars, that while, while uh, Abel was often making righteous sacrifices, Cain was making some other sacrifices. Cain was conjuring some things. One thing we understand, Abel was a prophet. I mean, you know, Abel was a prophet. He was a prophet. He was an intercessor. He was a priest. And Abel was a prophet whose, whose life the earth still cries out for because he stood as, as an intercessor before the altars of God. And I believe he was the only one at this time that was making sacrifices to God. He was the only one that was, that was interceding on behalf of Adam and of Eve who, who, who were in sin and, and, and Cain and whoever else was in the earth at the time, the rest of the family, that this is what he was doing. And for that, he was murdered. He was a forerunner of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 13, do not marvel, my brethren, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren, and he who does not love his brother abides in death. Do you see that? 
If I can't love you as, as a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, then I'm not of the life. Now, if you're a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ and I can't find a love for you, something's wrong. The world is still abiding in me. I'm still abiding in, in darkness and death. May God help me if that's the case. I'll tell you that when any believer finds hatred in their heart towards another believer, we got something out of order and we need to get it right. Let's not limit ourselves to love and words alone. Let, let, let me close here. I, th I think we need to come back and spend some time in this particular area. And when the time is right, we'll come back to it. But just to know where to get and to understand that God is calling us up into this, 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 this deeper place of, of existence.